In 1987, Howard Schultz took 11 local coffee shops and transformed them into what he calls the third place between work and home. Today, there are nearly 19,000 Starbucks stores in 62 countries. They're staffed by 200,000 people the company calls partners. Yet, this billionaire CEO recently declared that not every decision is an economic decision and that his fight for innovation is as much about the coffee he sells as the values he espouses. Which is why we add Howard Schultz to our exclusive list of the innovators. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Well, Howard Schultz, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you've actually mentioned that there's an emotion, the emotional connection is your true value proposition as a Starbucks. So I, I brought some Starbucks coffee that we bought at your support center. Thank you. And I hope we got it right, because I know you take this very seriously. So I'm going to pour you some Wonderful. coffee. I understand you take it black. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Um, now, this is your indivisible cup, which is a collector's item, I understand. <laughs> Why? I mean, we think of Starbucks as this incredibly profitable company, but you talk about that emotional connection first and foremost. Why is that so important? Well, it's not only an emotional connection. I, I think it goes beyond that. I, I think when we uh, began building the company, we created uh, a different uh, business proposition. Uh, not better than anyone else, but it really was different. And that was from the very beginning, recognizing that success would be best if it was shared and in a sense building a company that would try and achieve the fragile balance between profitability and a social conscience. So the emotional connection that you're asking about uh, speaks to the relationship that we wanted to have with our people first. We recognized early on that they were going to be the the brand and the promise was going to come from them and as managers and leaders if if we were going to try and exceed the expectations of our customers, then emotionally and through a large reservoir of trust, we had to exceed the expectations as managers and leaders of our people first. And I think that began to create uh, the unique relationship we have with our people and the relationship they have with the customers. And there's great authenticity to that, both in the relationship with your people and your customers, to the, to the, in a way that it's actually led to success, to economic success as well. That relationship matters in so many different ways. Well, there's no question about that. I mean, I think uh, when you look at the, uh, before the company went public in 92, Starbucks became the first company in America to provide equity in the form of stock options and comprehensive health insurance to every employee, including part-time people. And so, again, that was another example of recognizing that uh, there were some people who would think that would be dilutive to shareholder value and dilutive to profitability. But I think we, th we saw it, we, we were playing the long game from the very beginning. And the long game was invest in your people first. And as a result of that, you will make more profit and the company will be more sustainable. So we have a great relationship. I run a graduate program in digital media and technology and communication, and we have many of our students, alumni, even your chief digital officer, we have a relationship with them. And he's actually given a couple of guest lectures in my class. And I first heard this, that the Starbucks mission from him, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And when I heard Adam Brotman say that in my class a few months ago, I was utterly astounded mm. because I didn't really hear to make money. I, I heard to inspire and nurture, and it was about people first, uh, and, and not really, you know, is, this, is it more about, is it more than coffee? It's so much more than coffee. I mean, uh, in, in any business, is more, more than its product. But I, I think if I would say it a different way, or I would add to that, I would say that over the years, we have evolved to a performance-driven organization, but always through the lens of humanity. And, uh, and if you think about it, Starbucks will exceed $14 billion in revenue this year. However, the average sale of Starbucks is approximately $5. And so you, you couldn't find uh, a consumer brand or for that matter a company that is as dependent as we are on human behavior, on people. And so the equity of the brand, the emotional connection we have with our customers has to come down to how do we communicate with our people? How do we build trust with them? How do we maintain transparency? And how do we do all these things in a way that is, it's not about the what, 
but it's about the why. And when you came back, I mean, you, you obviously were CEO, you, found, you helped found the company essentially. You came back in 2008 uh, to be CEO again, and you documented in this book onward. What did you feel had to be addressed at that point that wasn't necessarily working at Starbucks then? Well, I came back in January of 08, but I, uh, I think it's important to say that even though I was not the CEO at the time of some of the self-induced problems, I was still to blame because as chairman, I was not paying as close attention as I should have. And I, I'm not some messiah. You know, I came back in 08, and people ask me all the time, you know, why'd you come back? Why'd you come back? I came back because of my love of the company and my responsibility to 200,000 people and their families to restore the company back to its rightful place. What we had to do is remind people and rekindle the core values of the company. We got in trouble for two reasons. The cataclysmic financial crisis intertwined with self-induced mistakes, and those self-induced mistakes were primarily a result of measuring and rewarding the wrong things and chasing profit as opposed to the balance I talked about earlier between profit and benevolence. And how, how, after all those years, were you able to come back and still have gas in your tank to find inspiration, to find yet new opportunities to take the company in a new direction in 2008? You know, I, I, I came back with uh, not even a renewed sense of purpose, but absolutely an uh, unbridled level of enthusiasm and passion and commitment, as I said, love, and as to what we needed to do. And uh, five years later, We've had two consecutive years of record revenue, record profit, and as we sit here today, I'm proud to say the stock is at the all-time high. Uh, but it, it's, it, it wasn't because only of me. It was about a, a level of uh, alignment and core purpose of a lot of people understanding what was most important. And you, you, you mentioned innovation. I think when we were at our best in the early years and then we were, when we were not at our best, two things changed, and it, it had a lot to do with innovation. Innovation has got to be uh, linked to a level of curiosity to see around corners and identify things that perhaps no one else sees, and then having the courage to make a big bet. Innovation is not a line extension. That's great. In fact, I want to talk about that more after we get back from the break and about your values and the further. We'll be right yeah. back with Howard Schultz. We're back with Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks. Howard, there was a, a recent article that said, agree or disagree with his values, you have to accept that Schultz is not a bystander. Uh, I think this is in reference to, to gay marriage, to the fact that you have been really outspoken on politics in Washington and on the economy. It's not typical of a CEO. Why is this so important to you? Uh, well, <laughs> I think I took on a somewhat unorthodox and perhaps unprecedented role in the last 18 months as a CEO of a public company speaking out in a sense, uh, not really against Washington, but uh, speaking out to say that perhaps the country is going in the wrong direction and there's issues that we need to address and specifically the leadership in Washington should be questioned with $17 trillion in debt the level of unemployment, the amount of states in a budget deficit, uh, the cuts in social services, and the unbelievable polarization in Washington and a lack of leadership. Uh, this is affecting all of us. And you know, whether you are a CEO of a public company or a citizen, I think our democracy at its best is based on the fact that we should have a voice and we shouldn't be a bystander. And what I notice around the country is we're all kind of walking around as if it's business as usual and we should embrace the status quo and I don't think we should. So with civility and a level of respect, I have been speaking out and trying to engage in a discussion with like-minded people that we need to uh, engage with Washington in a way that we produce a change in the way the country is being led. Now I'm not criticizing any specific person or criticizing the president, but I, I am suggesting that we are better than this. Speaking of which, I, I served you coffee in a cup that can't be purchased anymore because they yeah. sold out. But you guys had last year an amazing campaign called in yes. Indivisible. Yeah, and I, I just want to show a little video, uh, the first minute of the video that announced how you went about this. But essentially, you went to this town in Ohio. Liverpool, Ohio. Had a pottery factory. 
and uh, we're going to just show a little video. East Liverpool was the heart of manufacturing artisan ceramics for the entire country. America's table was set with all of these beautiful plates, mugs, dishes. A town which once functioned solely on the back of one industry had been wiped out and completely obliterated. There are thousands of facilities like the one we found in East Liverpool. And unfortunately, there are hundreds of small towns in America who have been left for dead. I think we're better than this. We deserve this. This was better than so this. well received. I love the fact that you narrated this. I mean, it was universally positive online. Mm -hmm. um, why was this so important to you? Well, I think that the, uh, the number of people in the country who are now being left behind for one reason or another find themselves with no voice. I had heard about this industry and specifically this area of the country that once was this thriving metropolis based on one industry. And I, I said, I, I want to go see it. So we literally went to East Liverpool and saw this. And then we saw the fact that if Starbucks created the opportunity, we could restore this factory and potentially others and, and restore the self-esteem of this town. And that's exactly what we did, and we're just getting started. Uh, I think there are, there are we, we all have a responsibility, I think, to do things that just are not based on ringing the register. They have to be based on a sense of humanity and the fact that we have a responsibility to help those people who are being left behind, and that's what Starbucks is trying to do in this town, and I think we're going to do it in many other places across the country. Well, it seems to be you're demonstrating the kind of leadership you want to see more of in the United States. So obviously you've been very successful. When we get back after the break, what I'd love to talk to you more about is, is your focus on basing your business here in Seattle and how the conditions here have actually supported the innovation that you've managed to champion so well. Sure. So we'll be right back with Howard Schultz. Back with Howard Schultz from Starbucks. Howard, we recently sat down with Jeff Brotman, who's a, who founded Costco, and he was talking about the values that Costco has in terms of how it treats its people. Nordstrom has the same thing, and Jeff had actually mentioned he had sat down with you at some point in terms of reconciling and sharing some of the approaches you have in terms of how you treat your people. Costco's a great company. Is there something, and, and you guys have a great relationship, yeah. is there something about the water in Seattle that fosters this kind of approach? You know, I've been asked that many, many times, both here at home and outside the country. What is it about Seattle? Uh, you know, I, I don't have a specific answer. Philosophically, I'd say it's a great place to live, so it attracts fantastic entrepreneurs who want to raise a family here. I think Nordstrom, in many ways, kind of uh, built the foundation of human service and treating people and their, and their customers in a way that others have followed. And the fact that Nordstrom, Costco, and Starbucks are three physical bricks and mortar retail companies that are founded here that have a th common thread of not only humanity, but trying to do the right thing for the customer and not, only, not always serving the bottom line, uh, I think is uh, part of what we've all been able to do that has created this reputation. I'm not sure if it's the water, <laughs> it's certainly not the rain. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, you are the company you keep, and it's a great, uh, to be part of those two other companies to be mentioned in the same sentence is an honor for all of us at Starbucks. Uh, I know you, you grew up in New York. Um, I imagine that if you had started this company, I don't know, if could you have started Starbucks in New York City? We could have started it in New York City, but it never would have been the same, never. I think the Northwest values are intrinsically linked to the values of the company and the reputation and what we've been able to do, no question. That's amazing. So, you know, Seattle's a boom and bust type of economy. Um, as you look at what you'd like to have as your legacy for the Seattle area in terms of what you bring and leave here, wh what would you like to see happen? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty young guy to think about legacy. Uh, Starbucks has been in business for 42 years. 
what, what, what I would hope that we, the reputation of the company over the long term w would be the balance that I talked about earlier. Uh, that you can, make, you can build a great company, you can be highly profitable, and you can do it in a way in which success is shared and that the, this balance of, so, of social responsibility and benevolence is as important as anything you do. The other thing I would say is that, uh, going back to your earlier question about Washington and leadership, I would also say that I, I think it's important to understand that I think companies going forward are going to have a much deeper level of responsibility to their employees and the communities we serve than ever before because the government is not going to have the resources to do what they've done in the past. And I think uh, Seattle, in many ways, because of the philanthropic nature of this community and how commerce is conducted, has an opportunity to make its mark on the country because of how we view uh, commerce, how we view our community. And I think, I think Seattle and the state of Washington can lead. And I'm, I'm curious, as a leader, how do you find the courage to stick to your convictions? I was quite struck in your book about how you were being pressured back in 2008 at the, at the height of the, the recession to actually cut the health benefit, yeah. which has been sacrosanct to you for so many years. How did you resist that? Well, I think uh, uh, leadership uh, can't be uh, embraced when it's convenient. Leadership has to be embraced during good and bad times. When the institutional investor was pressuring me to cut the health care benefit at Starbucks because it would be beneficial to the bottom line, what he did not understand is that would have fractured the trust and culture and values of the company and eventually would have crushed the bottom line. They, the two are, are, are absolutely linked together. And so when I speak about leadership uh, to young people or college students, uh, you, you want to understand what your core purpose and your values are, and you want to understand that those core values uh, and the foundation of them have to be 100% aligned with the business and not only when it's convenient. Well, I, th that's, I think that's a really good lesson as a lot of people look to emulate your success that they have to recognize that there's a certain price and a discipline that they have to, to instill if they want to move forward. And I, when we come back, I want to talk a little more about your thoughts about innovation, especially in your second act as CEO at Starbucks in terms of the amazing changes that you brought and some of the process sure. that you instilled in that. So we'll be right back with Howard Schultz from Starbucks. Four Peaks is made possible by generous support from the Museum of History and Industry and from Weber Shandwick. We're back with Howard Schultz from Starbucks. Howard, you've mentioned that one of the things you really struggle for is to maintain your relevance. I think your relevance is Starbucks. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that we're in this era of chaotic change with technology and globalization. How do you continue to keep things fresh and innovate in the way that maintains that relevance? Well, first off, I think that we are witness to a seismic change in consumer behavior, uh, mainly because of technology and the unbelievable tidal wave of the mobile platform and social and digital media. Having said that, uh, you know, we, we've never set out to be cool. We, we've always wanted to be relevant, and relevancy comes in many shapes and forms. We benefit from the fact that the physical environment that we created has become highly relevant as the third place, now, not only in America, but around the world. But we also recognize that customization is a key to the relevancy of what we do. Believe it or not, there are 89,000 different variations of beverages that we make behind the counter around the world. Wow, because some people would think, well, oh, Starbucks, that's sort of like McDonald's, it's mass production of a beverage. No, it's, it's you stand behind the counter and listen to what people order. But in addition to that, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to create uh, excitement, theater, romance through new products and new innovation. The best example of that was probably Via. We recognized a $50 billion global ca category of instant coffee that had not had any innovation for 50 years. People thought we were crazy to go after it. The press killed us at first, but we knew in our hearts that we wouldn't do it unless we could prove it in a cup, and through technology we did. But not only did we bring innovation to the marketplace, we also, it was a galvanizing event inside the company because it demonstrated to our own people the entrepreneurial courage, innovation, 
and conviction that we had as a company to take the road less traveled and do something that no one else could do, that's going to be a billion dollar business for Starbucks alone. Um, also, I think uh, not everything is going to work. And uh, I'd say you have to fail fast. You can't be afraid to fail. Uh, you got to celebrate small victories. You got to learn from your mistakes. And you got to, you, hap, you absolutely, in this world, have to recognize that the status quo, despite whether or not you're hitting home runs or not, are not good enough for tomorrow. It needs to be rejected because the status quo, I think, is a, a collision course with time. And you got to push for self renewal and reinvention. And the organization has to be imprinted with an understanding of what innovation truly means. And as I said earlier, innovation is not a line extension. Innovation has to be disruptive and bringing something to the marketplace that is not there before and that companies can, can uh, do something that people did not expect they needed. Uh, both very frightening and very exciting at the same time. If you were free of all obligation and expectation very briefly, it, what would you do right now? What do you mean by that? Well, if you were totally unfettered, untethered, and you could do anything you wanted to do right now. How I may not sound strange, but I'm, I'm, I'm living a dream. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm where exactly what I want to do. I'm, I, uh, I feel so blessed to be in a position I'm in and be with a company I love. And no, I, I, I wouldn't change places right now. Well, there's much to admire about that. Howard Schultz, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, CEO of Starbucks, business visionary, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And we invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us at fourpeaks.org. I'm Hanson Hossein. Production of Four Peaks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors.